Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House alongside my good friend, Mr. Martin Popoff. Martin, how are you? Ah, doing okay. Doing okay. Good to get back in the saddle now. And condolences again to the to thank the you. loss of Maya. Yeah, thank you, Maya. But no, Maya. Uh, yeah. yeah, she is very much missed. Um, but I think uh, you know when you lose a beloved pet, you go through some gr a grieving process for a few days, and then you get to the point where uh, you start to kind of reflect on the life you had with the she or he, and uh, you start remembering the good things, and you can look at pictures and things and and you know it's not this feeling of emptiness which for a couple of days that's what it was and you know she was she was my favorite of the three so and, you know you know it's hard to be it's like we don't pick favorites but sometimes you get one that just really you have that relationship with and that was her and myself so uh yeah so now it's like i think i'm past that hard point where it's like you know you, you, st you still miss i still miss her uh, but um, I think uh, um, the, the good feelings and of all the 12 years that we spent together and all the good times are coming more uh, instead of the feeling of, of this just sadness, right? But uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, I'm always going to miss her. But uh, yeah, but we're back. So uh, you even I, went to a thank, Merciful Fate show. I was just at Merciful Fate last night, and uh, man, the Sea of Tranquility fans were out in force last night. We were because we had a yeah. huge. Uh, crew of well, the Hudson Valley Squares were out at the show last night. We were all there together. We were getting stopped by people left and right, and uh, you know everybody had such, had such great things to say about the channel. And so many people were telling me, "I really missed you and Martin last Friday. I know you had a tough tough weekend, but uh, yeah. you guys going to be on tomorrow?" I'm like, yes, we're going to be on tomorrow, regardless of what time I get home tonight. We will be on tomorrow. So all here right. we are with Let's kind of uh, part two of uh, our episode from two weeks ago uh where we talked about some of the uh you know with the exception of the the big four and i, I do want to touch on something there for a second too mm -hmm. uh the big four who we discussed were led zeppelin black sabbath deep purple and uriah heap uh we were talking about some of the other bands that kind of came before that also greatly influenced the scene but a lot of comments martin over in in the in, ensuing two weeks questioning that uriah heap shouldn't have been included in that big four I mean, yeah. that to me, that that's always it's always been those four. And people don't seem to think <clears throat> that Uriah he played that significant in a role in that. I don't know if you have any comments on that at all. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Um, you know, we love Heap. Um, you know, obviously, I think the thing is they're just not the biggest band. Um, but the fact of the matter is there are there are a bunch of smaller bands that 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 contributed less. But the fact of the matter is Uriah Heap, what they contributed, you know, early. Oh, sorry, what is it? I'm, I, th I think it's middle of 1970 for very heavy, very humble. Um, but the fact of the matter is that that record there in 1970, I've always considered it even more forceful an argument than the first Black Sabbath album. It's just that the first Black Sabbath album came earlier. Right. Um, and then maybe not as forceful as Paranoid, but pretty much up there, not not as heavy as Deep Purple in Rock. But I've always said that, you know, the, the crushing production they get on that, that's the best produced album out of all four of those. Uh, yeah, I um, agree. It's incredible. Yeah. And and you think of the, the heaviness of the production and the way that the guitars mix with the Hammond organ thing. I've always said this, that that deep that your eye heap got that sound that Deep Purple gets all the credit for. And I remember they, they even rehearsed next to each other. But Deep Purple gets credit for all that sound and the fame of that sound. But I think Deep Purple, or, or Uriah Heap actually got there first with that album. And then even with uh, even with Look at Yourself, which is beautifully recorded and super heavy as well. My favorite, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so Deep Purple really didn't actually make a record as good as those two records in terms of the entire fidelity and the sound and that and that alloy between the guitars and the Hammonds until 1972 with Machine Head because Fireball doesn't sound that great in rock doesn't sound that great um you know granted like I say in rock is heavier um but uh but no he he definitely gets in there with a key 1970 album as good as those other 1970 albums that's my take on it yeah I would agree and uh I, I think uh some people kind of look at things like this in terms of like album sales and hits and then all that sort of thing. And while 
and again, I haven't looked at the numbers. I would say very, 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 very humble is probably the the lowest selling of the four albums. Maybe not off by that much, um, and didn't spawn any singles or you know radio songs. Uh, mm-hmm. It's no less impactful, and I think you have to look at those four albums as I mean, they're all all four of them heavy for the time, right? We had other heavy albums like we yeah. explained in the previous episode, but uh, yeah, I just and and you know maybe in, in historically speaking, Heap were not as big as the other three bands, and I think that's why some people tend to discount them a little bit when having this discussion. But yeah. for in 1970, they're right there. Yeah, and and Salisbury's maybe not that heavy, but I mean, you think of Bird of Prey. I mean, Gyp- Gypsy alone, but but walking in your shadows and uh, and you know the stuff on Look Yourself. But Bird of Prey is just is just crushingly heavy for the day, right? And modern. Our point was that they're modern. Yeah. That that's the whole thing. Like they're getting away from the blues, so they're mm-hmm. absolutely they they absolutely belong. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in in response to everything we talked about two weeks ago, we're going to now talk about, and we had a lot of people asking about some of these bands we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about the American response to this kind of birth of heavy metal, which seemed to be simmering in the UK, right? But we had, you know, we did mention a couple of US bands the last time around. Now we're specifically going to be talking about those US bands that kind of really got their start around 1970 uh, into like 1973. So we're looking at a chunk of about three years here and uh we've got some uh, really interesting bands to talk about so i'll have martin kick us off with his first selection here yeah so so our idea here you know i've always had this thought that um you know you could almost call this episode it ain't much because the american response is kind of anemic and and it's like well okay why is it sort of anemic right because you know and it's a little messy because we did talk about some american bands in the first one and we got hacked for leaving out vanilla fudge you know carmine and all that yeah. too i noticed that in the comments but so and my the, first and the jeff choice, beck in the jeff beck group which i'm like I'm right yeah couldn't believe exactly them, yeah, yeah that that's like the prototype of leds Zeppelin one, that whole argument thing that goes on. Right. Um, But, uh, but yeah, so there are some, you know, pretty important American bands, Stooges, MC5, Blue Cheer being probably at the top Mm -hmm. of that whole thing. Jimi Hendrix, uh, you know, uh, but so, so my first one's a little messy because it, it really sort of um, it, it straddles this thing and it, and it really drives home the point of the, the ain't much because It doesn't get good for Ted Nugent until 1975, which is outside of the purview of what we're talking about here, because so the Amboy Dukes come along. They are in the 60s and they're from Detroit, but they start the ain't muchness immediately because they're not as heavy really as um, as Stooges and MC5. They're more of a psych band. They're a little weird. Um, But as you as you click over into 1970, so so we're calling this a response because of what we just said. There's there's all this UK stuff that that comes in 1970. Um, So so now we're looking at this sort of 70 to 73 period. And and what does America have to say about it? And and again, it ain't much is 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 what you're going to notice from this. So so with Ted Nugent. You've got the Amboy Dukes, Journey to the Center of the Mind, 68, Migration, 69. Then you get this weird album. I remember getting this, uh, you know, pretty young and and thinking, what the heck is this thing? Marriage on the Rocks slash Rock Bottom. Like, oh, those those albums with two titles just drive me crazy, right? Like, stop, stop, stop with that, right? Um, But then you get another sort of... um, you get another um, wilderness album, Survival of the Fittest. Literally, he's, he's dressed for the woods on the cover of that thing, right? Um, but then um, you get you know, get more lineup changes because Ted's always the boss and he's hiring, firing, and people are dropping out because you know his he wants hard work. He doesn't want these guys on drugs and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, but he comes back with Call of the Wild in 73, and then Tooth, Fang, and Claw is again outside of our purview. But the idea is when he gets on Zappa's label at that point, he's got these two albums. You see the birth of this, but it takes a long, long time. And both Call of the Wild and Tooth, and, uh, Tooth Bang and Claw are, uh, are um, did I say Tooth and Nail earlier? I don't know if I did. Anyways, they're both pretty similar and they both sound like badly written versions of what you get on Ted Nugent. And they sound like the demos of what you get on Ted Nugent. Um, our, our good, fu- our, our good friend, Monty Connor uh, loves to fang and claw. I, there's some other people. I think Jack and Dino really likes it too. Um, and it's pretty good. And it is the better of the two, but, but I had, you know, you know, both of those albums are, um, 
show everything that's wrong with the American response. They're they're still they're still kind of like boogie rock and bluesy and and really dated like they sound like they're from 1973 and nine and that's why that's why we give all this invention of the heavy metal thing to the british because by 72 and 73 i mean they're piling it on right like i say we we've got our look at yourself and demons and wizards and magician's birthday sweet freedom volume four master of reality sabbath bloody sabbath like we're way up into into some amazing metal at this point and even ted nugent what is it five six albums in um you know he's making no money yet he's nothing yet i mean basically it, it takes to this album where he breaks and this and this is a pretty modern record um this is pretty good modern heavy metal but the point is it's 1975 it's just yeah. just like ridiculously later right yeah. so um so that's my first choice in this uh is in this it ain't much because even by 1973 with ted one two three four five six records in it ain't much with call of the wild yeah and you know one of the things that you you kind of just mentioned which i think is going to be key in some of the ones that i'm going to talk about is you mentioned some of those classic albums you know you threw out a whole list of titles there yeah. and I, I don't think anybody would argue that most of those albums like start to finish are classic and all pretty heavy right whereas i think i've got some bands here that for sure had some heavy material but some of the albums i'm going to talk about and show don't all contain heavy material right you've got some heavy mm -hmm. songs but you've got some really light stuff too that kind of like i don't it, it's almost like the the american response was like they were not full in they weren't all in on this. They were like, well, we want to play in, in this ballpark, but you know, it's not all about baseball. We still like football. We still like soccer, that sort of thing. So we're going to, we're going to dip our, our feet in a little bit, but we're not going to go full bore. Uh, my first uh, band here is uh, mountain, right? So of course mountain got their start uh, with the uh, Leslie West solo album called mountain and Leslie decided to take the name of this album and actually create a band who debuted uh, in front of the world at Woodstock, right? And then Mountain would be the name going forward. And, you know, there's some fairly heavy stuff on here, but it's very bluesy, riffy type of rock mixed with some folk and some avant-garde pop and things like that. But, you know, the band Mountain would debut with Climate. And of course, the hit single on here is this really heavy, catchy, riffy, cowbelly song, Mississippi Queen, right, which would become a legendary, legendary song. Uh, but it's like, I think most people have this perception uh, that these early mountain albums are crushingly heavy albums, because again, the notable songs are pretty heavy. That's what it seemed like the world and the media and radio and whatnot focused on at the time. You know, you got theme for an imaginary Western not all that heavy, right? Never in my life is heavy. But then you've got like all these kind of like folky songs on here, you know, for Yasgur's Farm, uh, you know, To My Friend, Sitting on a Rainbow, which is kind of bluesy. Uh, Silver Paper is pretty cool. But it's again, and it's a theme here, bands from the U.S. wanting to do some heavy stuff, but they're not necessarily committed to doing it for full albums all right uh and you got you know this great guitar player leslie west felix papillardi corky lang uh that's like the, the core of the classic trio uh you've got nantucket sleigh ride okay also has some notable tracks but not overall that heavy same thing with uh, flowers of evil you got a selection of heavy you know they did cross rotor which is a play on you know crossroads uh a couple other songs that kind of tip the Richter scale a little bit but for the most part it's amazing like how much kind of like folk and blues and pop are on these albums so again kind of like the the Asbury Dukes I mean it's like um not not all in 100% on the heavy factor but still doing enough where it's it's raising eyebrows here in the U.S. that's like oh we have some heavy bands of our own right uh but I think you know looking back on the career of mountain you have some and, and there's i'm not saying that the folk stuff and the other non-heavy stuff isn't really good because it is but i think if you were to make one album of all their heavy material that's a pretty heavy album but that's like it's really a, a kind of smallish percentage of what's on all these early albums so there's mountain yeah. to kick us off here yeah so mountain is you know one of the bands that was called america's led zeppelin you can almost call them america's cream and what do you got here you've you've got bands that so we touched on this in the last episode and and i remember we did a lot of research when we did the metal evolution stuff but america has uh, you know, a, a heavy blues tradition, 
right? And and Britain has uh, a heavy all all the big classical artists were from Europe, and they're, and they're all from mainland Europe, actually, right? Um, but you know, so so Europe has the classical tradition. Now they also have it. It muddies the waters, uh, you know, to to make a pun, I suppose. Um, but uh, they have the British blues boom, right? But the Americans, like Mountain, so so they're so they're they're picking up on the American blues tradition and the British blues boom. So there's there's the grass is greener over there. Oh, we love all these blues artists. That's what we grew up on. The heavy blues. They grew up on Cream and Hendrix and all that. Right. Yeah. So so you get that from them. And just one other point I want to make is is even Mississippi Queen, which has an extreme vocal and it has really fuzzy guitar. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, it's essentially structured like a blues song. So even that doesn't have the true moder modernity to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's true. It definitely has as modern a fuzz pedal as you want to have. And it's, you know, a heavy drumming and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, again, again, it's the whole, it ain't much thing. There's no, there's no Diablos in Musica. There's no getting rid of the blues. It's really got a foot still in the past. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so my next choice is, um, <clears throat> Alice Cooper. So here's another band that everybody, you know, kind of thinks because they look so heavy. I mean, look at that. I mean, they look really heavy there, right? Uh, 1971. And then look at this. So 1971. So this is the quintessential heavy metal looking band um, and the whole image and all that and some heavy material. But again, um, you know, it's an American band that doesn't have that imagination uh or or the will or whatever i mean you could say they have great taste or better taste than the metal bands whatever but the point is is it still sounds pretty dated um it's not exactly not really at all i guess based in uh the blues in a big way but it's kind of based in a in a um just a mainstream hard rock and I guess truly not very imaginative in a, in a lot of ways in terms, in terms of the structures of what they're doing. I've, I've never liked the productions of these albums very much either. I think, I think that kind of sucks, sucks out some of the heaviness that could have been there um, that is missing. Um, but, uh, but same thing as mountain, um, you know, there's, there's two to four songs kind of on every album. And, and if you added it all up, there'd be some great heavy metal material. But, you know, the other amazing thing about Alice Cooper, though, um, you know, with our with our, you know, our gate more or less closing in 1973, that's the entire original Alice Cooper band. Yeah. Which is pretty right. impressive. Right. <laughs> yep. So so to have had uh, by, you know, Killer and then Schools Out. With the, with the great heavy you know title track billion dollar babies with the great heavy title track muscle of love with the great heavy title track um so to have the entire canon um you know over and done with by 1973 which which always you know every time i think back to um deep purple mark two i always remember that too it's like man wow that was over and done by 1973 Very it's quick. crazy right yeah. um you, you never really think of it that way you think of them as 70s band oh they're around for the whole 70s kind of thing so so alice cooper you know god love them for doing seven albums uh in this thing as an american response but again it ain't much there's there's not a lot of heavy metal to it they aren't as heavy metal a, a, a band as you know when we put on our rose colored glasses uh think of them as kind of thing. yeah so there you yeah go. and i think with the uh, you know you mentioned before this whole use of like fuzz pedals right i mean we talked about that a lot in the first episode of this and uh mm -hmm. You know, Glenn Buxton and Michael Bruce uh, not using a lot of fuzz on a lot of these songs and albums. Mm -hmm. And I don't think of the Alice, the original Alice Cooper group, their material is all that riffy. And it's definitely yeah. not bluesy. Uh, to me, it's more kind of like garage rock um, yep. meets this kind of like Broadway theatricality, which I know comes yep. from Alice himself. Point, yep. And I don't think any of the other bands that we're going to talk about today really kind of mm -hmm. came to it with that in mind and there's a gothicness to it as well which i think was fairly new and innovative at the time so uh yeah. definitely i mean a groundbreaking band but yeah uh i think we have again this perception that these albums were heavier uh than they actually are right uh i don't think that um most of these bands were really kind of doing it as heavy as as the british bands were 
they wanted to, but, you know, and maybe, and some might argue uh, that they're bringing different things to the table and these albums have more variety and that's what makes them so special, which I, you know, I can see that as well. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right. So we, uh, when I, we talked about mountain, we talked about how some people compare them to, you know, America's Led Zeppelin or certainly America's cream. And I think that mountain definitely went more the cream route, although maybe less, you know, on the live side, less of uh, the Im- improvisational beasts that cream were. Uh, well, now, how about the band that actually was labeled the American Led Zeppelin? And I'm talking about Cactus, right? So, you know, here you had kind of a, sort of a super group, right? You got Carmine Apiece and Tim Bogert from coming over from the Vanilla Fudge. You got Jim McCarty, excellent guitar player from Mitch Ryder's Detroit Wheels. And then you've got uh, Rusty Day, who also sang in the Amboy Dukes, right? So kind of sort of a super group here and a very, very different beast than the Vanilla Fudge, because, of course, now there's no Hammond organ in this. Uh, but they're also doing like mixes of old blues covers and pop covers and, you know, doing them up their style as well as some uh, original material. And they come out with, uh, of course, the debut album kind of phallic looking there, right? It's like, you really look at that like, all right, it's just a, it's just a lonely cactus. And like, well, wait a second. Oh, that, that could be, yeah, all right. We won't talk about that. I thought it looked like a middle finger too. That's yeah, that as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Either or, either or. Um, to me, I never got the American Led Zeppelin thing here. I don't think that they sound at all like Led Zeppelin. I never understood that one bit. And I don't know whether that's just because it's bluesy. I don't know. But uh, for me, um lots of blues on these albums and tons of boogie done up with some fuzz and lots of volume i think that was basically their thing there there is some kind of like little folky bits on some of these albums as well you know you got this amazing rhythm section uh bogart and a piece are just uh, they work so well together for so many years uh you've got some sizzling guitar riffs and licks on these albums um which were always kind of the highlights you know lots of covers though Lots of covers. So here, you know, Parchment Farm was the big song on here. Of course, a cover, right? You got Brother Bill. Again, this kind of mix of boogie and up-tempo rockers. Honestly, Martin, not all that different from kind of like some of the early Southern rock stuff, which I always found on these albums, right? Uh, for me, I, I love One Way or Another, which is their second album. This uh, The title track is absolutely scorching. But then you got, you know, Long Tall Sally, uh, Rock and Roll Children, Big Mama Boogie. Again, lots of boogie. It's just, it's very, very American sounding really American sounding. And they would continue on uh, with the original lineup um, on restrictions, but then, you know, by the, uh, the fourth album, and again, four albums in like just under two years. So that we're talking about a really small sample here. Uh, you've got um, McCarty leaves. They're bringing in two guitar players, right. For this album, which is not quite as good, but uh, a very, very notable band. Apparently, again, I've only seen them live in latter day uh, apparently they were a great band to see live but uh you know a bunch of hellraisers i think that was also something about some of these american bands is they were also trying to outdo the brits as far as like the wild and crazy guys out on the road uh you know the groupies and the loud concerts and smashing hotel rooms and getting in trouble to drinking the drug and all that kind of stuff living the life um but yeah but a great band uh, again, Cactus will probably go down in history as a very cool early 70s, kind of heavy band at times, uh, but you know, not all that groundbreaking. I love them, don't get me wrong, but uh, I, w- I would never talk of Cactus in the same uh, level as the four bands we talked about two weeks ago. Um, you know, or the, the highlights of, of those, uh, you know, of those years, the, the four big bands, but, uh, but important nonetheless. And I guess if you're, you know, Carmine at Peace, uh, who is such a legendary figure, it's part of his history, right? And an important one. So, but yeah, but, uh, and I definitely think Cactus also paved the way for a, a bunch of other bands that would come like afterwards, uh, other U.S. bands. But yeah, cool band though. Yeah, I, I love that you use the term not all that groundbreaking because that's the theme of this. Like none of these bands are particularly groundbreaking. And you know, obviously they're not very heavy. And that's and if if the viewers are frustrated at our choices, believe me, by the end of it, we'll we'll have we'll have given you all the heavy stuff. And it's just we're not calling any of it very heavy. That's the point, right? Um, so the American response, I, again, there, there's just not a not a lot to it's not super impressive by 1973 kind of thing. Um or up to 1973. So, uh, so on that front, um, my next choice is Blue Oyster Cult. Um, 
So again, uh, they have they have an album in 1972. This is the one that at, at you know the end of our time frame here, Tyranny Mutation. And again, this is a band that um, sounds pretty dated. The the productions aren't that great. Um, they're coming from a past where they're kind of doorsy. They're even kind of grateful, grateful deadish. You know, soft white underbelly, Osaka, Stock Forest Group, all the all the per, you know preceding names and that. It's mostly the same guys actually, but. Um, so they're coming into this, um, you know, they famously um, talk about how seeing Alice Cooper live really changed their sound. It's almost like Alice Cooper moves to Detroit to get their sound heavier. Blue Oyster Cult goes to see Alice Cooper to get their sound heavier. Um, but, you know, both of them have a large amount of doors in them. And that's a pretty dated thing. I mean, that's some of the most dated music you can imagine in a way. Right. Um, so, you know, God love the doors. They're amazing and stuff, but boy, are they, are they of a time, right? Like, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, so Alice Cooper's got that BOC has got that. So the other thing about BOC famously is that, you know, Warner brothers had their black Sabbath and Columbia wanted our version of black Sabbath. Right. Um, so they get this band and, um, They've got an amazing name. They got amazing cover art. They look really cool and heavy. Um, but musically, they they can't quite get there to be America's version of Black Sabbath. It comes out all pretty wobbly during that black and white period. It's it's pretty it's it's cool. I mean, it's great, great lyrics and stuff. And, and it's and it's and it's weird and wild and creative. It's just not particularly heavy. Even even, you know, Secret Secret Treaty is the one, you know, that is lauded as the greatest bluish cult album of all time. I've got five choices I like better later on. Um, but, uh, you know, e even by then, so this entire black and white period, 74 into the double live album on your feet or on your knees. And then they, they actually never really become that heavy a band. And in, in fact, arguably they come even become even lighter. Um, so they never really fit in this whole thing in a big way, but you go see them live. Of course, it all sounds super heavy live and it looks really scary and all that stuff. And Eric with his glasses and all that. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, out there, out there, you know, in, in a small hockey barn, they're going to look super heavy and sound super heavy. But uh, again, um, they're, they're, they're remaining still, they're, they're stuck in, in just not being at the level of a black Sabbath, you know, not, not that they want to be, but we're, but we are measuring heaviness on this show. So um, they're just, they're just not in the same place as, as heap and deep purple and Sabbath. Yeah. And that's, and that's a key statement right there. We're, 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 we're measuring heaviness, right. And, and the response to those first four heavy bands. And we're not saying that these bands aren't really good because we, we love them. We're talking yeah. about them for a reason here, but uh, it's just yeah. kind of to, yeah. Exactly. Anyway, speaking of all that, so let's go to New York, right? So, uh, of course, in the uh, in the late '60s, going into the early '70s, there's uh, there's a, a little hard rock thing happening in New York, and uh, one of the bands to kind of emerge from this scene, uh, I believe they got together in '69. Their first album came out in 1970. By '71, they're already done. The band is Sir Lord Baltimore. All right, who come out with this album, uh, Kingdom Come, and then the follow up self titled Sir Lord Baltimore. Uh, and this is another perfect example of, uh, you know, not keeping the heavy factor going for very long. This actually, this first album is pretty heavy. I would say, out of a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about today, this might be, uh, well, other than another one I'm going to talk about at the end, this might be the heaviest album of all of these albums right here. And for its time, uh, Again, utilizing fuzz and distortion, and it's a trio on here. You got pretty raw vocals. You got really heavy drums. I would say that these guys, again, whether they were or not, I don't know. Uh, we're probably listening to Blue Cheer. We're probably listening to MC5 and the Stooges because there's that little, little kind of energetic punk undertone on the on both of these albums. But this album has got you know big riffs the overdriven guitar sounds are just massive on here. You got songs like, you know, they'll cross these two albums, Hellhound, Mr. Hardick, Lady of Fire, uh, Pumped Up, Women Tamer, Caesar, uh, Man from Manhattan, all really heavy songs, energetic songs, kind of extreme for the time. But then, you know, when they come out with the second album, all of a sudden they're like, oh, now, you know, now we're going to get a little experiment, uh, experimental. We're going to lighten things up a little bit. We're going to stretch out a little bit more. And all of a sudden, like all that heaviness from the debut is it's there a little bit, but not quite. And then you blink and they're gone already. So, uh, and, and, you know, apparently, I mean, they were signed to Mercury. Mercury dropped them fairly quickly. It's almost like there were a lot of promise here. They came out with this and Mercury was kind of like, eh, 
we, we wanted another heavy album. You didn't really deliver it. So see you later. Uh, you know, the band came back later, much later on, uh, released another album, but that's a story for another day. And uh, they, they've kind of gone down in history as this very, very obscure New York band that some people know about, uh, but most people don't. And again, greatly influenced, I think, by all the bands we talked about in the first episode, the, the big ones and the, and the, the, the other ones, and uh, just kind of couldn't keep it going. Or maybe, you know, I mean, I don't know, Martin, I guess if you're a young band, regardless of where you're from, and you get signed to a major label very early on, and it doesn't really work, and you get, you know, you get dropped, um, it's kind of crushing, right? There's, there's no, you know, nowadays you get dropped from a label, you go find another one, you release your stuff on your own. But back then it's like, that's kind of devastating to a band. Um, and uh, unfortunately they'll just go down as one of the more obscure bands in, in this kind of, you know, proto metal thing we're talking about. But, uh, you know, first album, really damn good. Second album's pretty strong too. But again, uh, that heaviness factor didn't quite continue uh, all the way through, but really good band nonetheless, yeah. for those who haven't heard them. Yeah, and that that was a great bunch of myth busting because this is one of those bands that you know the music snobs always want to mention. This band is ah, oh, forget Black Sabbath, Sir Lord Baltimore, man. It's like wait a minute, just forget Black Sabbath. I think Black Sabbath, even though it's less cool to say you know who Black Sabbath is, um, it, it's 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 uh it's it's better than Sir Lord Baltimore by a factor of several times, right? Sort of thing, right? Um, so you know, there's a reason these bands you know didn't get big or whatever. And, and and even this band, so so this even even exposes an extra thing where they really try like they're, they're or sound like they're trying to be a heavy band. And, you know, because they're American and there's this weird American curse of nobody really being all that impressive, um, they they don't succeed. Uh, and and there's and there's like you say, there's that oldness that goes back to that Stooges MC5 thing. But there's blues and rock and roll and predictability. And just it sounds pretty dated when you when you put it up against, all, you know, all this stuff that that, you know, like I say, frankly, might be somewhat infused by classical more so than blues. Um, and that's pushing, you know, the evolution of heavy metal forward at a rapid pace through those big uh, British bands. And and it ain't happening in, in America sort of thing. So, yeah, not quite. Yeah. All right. So my next choice is it's basically the same narrative as as your cactus in your mountain, uh, really, in, in many ways, is uh, is ZZ Top. So you got ZZ Top's first album. You've got Rio Grande Mud. And then at the end of our date closed down you've got tres hombres so again um so this is a band they're from texas they're steeped in southern rock they're steeped in the blues they're steeped in that whole 60s scene uh you know famously they opened for Jimi hendrix um you know so they're also they also have uh you know a romanticizing of the british blues boom you know with hendrix who kind of became a semi-british band in a way um so hendrix um you know, cream, Yardbirds, all that stuff. They're loving all that stuff and they're loving psych. So, so they are so rooted in all of these traditions that are really traditional. Right. Um, but, um, you know, I always love them because, you know, this is a whole nother rant, but this idea of, of how these bands made the blues interesting. If you, if you, you know, tended to love heavy metal kind of thing. Right. So them and fog hat are always inextricably linked. Um, they're so similar bands. Um, so so this is a band that um, is uh, is again at, at the at the heavy end and the riffy end and the and the slightly distorted guitar end uh, and, you know, the sped up blues um, and the and the moving away from blues and taking taking, you know, the heaviest things from the blues and the heaviest things from boogie, putting them together and and throwing in the odd heavy metal riff uh, that you get. Uh, to make up these records and especially uh, where are we? So on the second record, you've got something like just got paid a um, couple, a couple of heavy, heavy ones on the second side on the first album, nothing much. It's, it's closer to your cream and cactus. And then when you get to the third album, you've got stuff like beer drinkers and Hellraisers, pretty modern heavy metal song um, master of sparks, pretty cool Arranged, not very heavy metal, but written heavy metals. The way I kind of look at that one, same with precious and grace actually, which is quite heavy. Um, Lagrange, not really. Um, so yeah, you've got, you've got a few there. They're, they're moving. So I, I would say they're my favorite, the most entertaining of that 
cactus um, mountain trilogy, if you will. Um, but again, not much. And, uh, and their head space is, they're just not wired at all. Like your eye heap. No, no, yeah. not at all. But another one of the few bands we're talking about today that had a bona fide guitar hero in their midst. Right. That's important yep. too. <clears throat> and I think that that kind of carried over from the sixties because most of the other bands that we talked about in the other episode uh, had in their lineup, a, you know, recognized guitar hero. Uh, and here you've got, of course, you know, Billy Gibbons. Uh, we talked about, you know, Leslie West before. There's another guy I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes. But, uh, you know, that always helped things. I think when you had that guy who was looked at as like this, you know, mythological being with the cranking out the riffs and a great soloist or improviser or what have yeah. you and had the look. So, all right. So uh, this narrative on this one is very, very similar to the Sir Lord Baltimore thing. A very young band who kind of burst on the scene got signed very early on to a major label who, of course, after a couple records, kind of gave up on them. And that was the end of that, right? Uh, this band was originally from Pennsylvania. They wound up relocating to Florida shortly after they got their record deal, uh, but th th they were from Pennsylvania. The band is Bang, mm -hmm. okay? Who, uh, you know, I, I, this is at, at a time where I think lots of labels were looking for the next black sabbath right we, we kind of talked about that already with blue to call uh bang were looked at that way as well and again a power trio who honestly had more in common with like early grand funk railroad than they did black sabbath but i think uh so they they worked on they got signed to the the, the capital records uh contract and they put together and recorded an album that they submitted to the label which uh was this album death of a country which the label rejected and they're like that's not what we're looking for. That's not Black Sabbathy enough. You got to go back and start all over again. So they ditched this album. This was not released till many, many years later when this box set came out, which is fantastic, by the way, for anybody interested, Rise Above Relics. Um, so that was scrapped. So they actually went back into the studio and they recorded the self-titled Bang album, which is more Black Sabbathy in spots. Right. So, again, this is another one of those bands, another one of those albums that, uh, you know, however many songs are on here, I forget there's probably like uh, eight tracks. Right. There's probably four, maybe five heavy songs on here. But again, original heavy, not quite. They're kind of like Black Sabbathy, Grand Funk Railroady. Uh, and then the other songs are kind of like because th these guys love the Beatles, right? So you got these kind of like little poppy folky things, which really don't mesh with the other songs, right? But of course, they had one semi hit on here called Question, all right, which is kind of like this kind of psychedelic pop rock song, right? It's nothing all that heavy. Um, then they release uh, this album, Mother Bow to the King, which again, very similar. You have a handful of pretty heavy rocking songs on here, not quite Sabbath heavy, but fairly heavy for a u.s band and then the other songs are kind of like they're good right but they're kind of not along the same you know the same lines and uh you know they would tour relentlessly with everybody and by the time they released their uh, officially third album it's now their fourth album uh here music this is not heavy at all uh for the most part it, there's maybe one or two heavy songs on here and then guess what happens the label drops them they fade into obscurity and break up uh and and this room you know these guys remind me and again oh maybe i should just save this comment for at the end of the show but there's another u.s band that i completely forgot about that everybody talks about it's like oh one of the heaviest bands of the early 70s and they only released two albums they're so heavy and like nah fuck it i'm just gonna talk about it right now uh <laughs> the band is dust right <laughs> i mean you know you look at this you're like you look at these album covers you're like oh yeah. heavy early heavy metal great neither of these albums are all that heavy there are heavy songs on here this is very similar to the bang situation you got some heavy songs but there's this like historical opinion and perspective that du the dust albums are you know some of the earliest examples of u.s heavy metal and i don't know about you martin i mean i like them but there's not that much heavy stuff on either of those albums. Yeah. You know, but that's the thing with Bang. I, I quite frankly find Bang heavier than Dust, but uh, I just wanted to kind of make that comment there. But uh, good material on these albums, but it, it's, you know, it's not, this is not, you know, Led Zeppelin 4, and this is not uh, Black Sabbath Master Reality, you know, any of that stuff. But good, solid US hard rock and little bits of metal. But um, yeah, still not quite there. Not quite. Yeah. And another ridiculous double title, right? 
Oh yeah, mother slash yeah. bow to the king. What? Yeah. Just call so it he, he, to the even king. two album titles couldn't make them twice as heavy. No, so. and, and you know, yeah. and these, these were like thirty-two minute long albums, right? It's like, the, it's like yeah, yeah. break. It's like just pick one or the other, right? Because yeah. it doesn't make any sense. There's no connection there. Mother slash bow to the king. Yeah, why you do have it? You do have. Uh, I mean, just yeah. Anyway, <laughs> and with dust, you know, you get into those uh, those Facebook arguments, and people are saying how heavy dust is, and my my comment always back is, "Don't suicide me." You know, it's like you're all you're thinking about is suicide. You're thinking about that song. Right. Yeah. When you say that, it's like when I say don't Barracuda me. Right. Yeah. You know, heart. Oh, they're so heavy. Right. You know, oh, look, look at Barracuda. Look how heavy heart is. Right. It's like yeah. you're naming one song to me. Yeah. You know, kind I mean, of thing, right? and again, for folks watching, it's not we don't dislike these at all. I like these albums. Yeah. But these aren't these massively heavy albums that everybody seems to think they are. And that, you know, that's not a bad thing. It's just that there is there, there's a perception out there that yeah. these are classic early 70s heavy metal albums. And I wonder why that, that perception is there. Look at those album covers. The right? album covers, they're spectacular, right? And but it's you know, they were it's yeah, but yeah. The, the the music inside is very good, but it's not it's not yeah. crushingly heavy. I, I think I don't know. I I I did this not long, like a couple, like a couple of years ago. I actually went through and listened to every single song again, and I kind of like ranked them on heavy uh, with a heavy factor. Yeah. I don't think there's more than three heavy songs on the on both yeah, of the yeah. albums. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. My it's entire fun. set, you know, collector's guide to heavy metal the seventies. I on a whim decided. <laughs> I'm going to rate every, you know, thousand record reviews or 1700, whatever it is. I rated every single album in there with a heaviness factor and how much I like them factor. So everyone is seven slash eight or whatever. Right. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know, the other funny thing is that, you know, they call that album a heart attack. Right. And then I, I always remember this, like, like being, being like uh, sucked in by the seventies ads in circus and cream and all that, because, the, you know, the hype would always be talking about how heavy these albums are. And then you get the album and it wasn't very heavy. And it's like that 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 goes to that argument uh, that I always say. It's like you like heavy metal, but you just don't know it. So all these label executives thought it was a good idea to call the Nantucket album heavy or an REO Speedwagon album heavy. Right. They all thought it was a good idea. The album wasn't very heavy, but gee, you know, doesn't that mean like heavy metal sells and you should actually have more heavy metal bands, right? <laughs> but you know, so here's dust like like promising heaviness, but just not delivering it, you know, heart attack. Well, why did you even call it that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. They probably. called it that because because of the song Suicide, right? Yeah, probably. So, <laughs> yeah, one song, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the whole Led Zeppelin. Oh, we've got something for everybody on this album, which means mathematically you've only you're not satisfying everybody very much, right? right. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, my last choice, taking us right up to 1973. They only had one album in 1973, Aerosmith. So I had to include them in here to drive home the point that you know, 70, 71, 72, 73. Much as I love Aerosmith to death, and they become a pretty darn good heavy metal band right after this with get your wings and certainly with some stuff on toys in the attic and rocks you know nobody's fault rats in the cellar by that point they're uh they're a gleaming heavy metal machine at times when they want to be right but um this really underscores the point that i i always consider this kind of a rickety dated um still pretty bluesy not very riffy still stuck in the past essentially this is blue oyster cult crossed with mountain and cactus you know some little bit of led zeppelin to it or whatever a little bit of yard birds um but it's still pretty down and dirty barroom rock and roll boogie woogie album they they just you know they would grow by leaps and bounds as songwriters and in terms of even riffs and some heaviness uh, on get your wings i love get your wings to death um you know love all those albums you know, they're all they're all eight eight point five nine ten for me um but this is this is your basically your uh you know if i'm gonna be harsh about it a, a 6.5 to me um but yeah, it just drives home the point that uh, even a band who's going to participate and do a pretty good job. And, you know, frankly, in the late 70s, these bands kind of take over and, and you know, our, our British heroes kind of falter sort of thing. And, uh, and it becomes the pendulum shifts and, and a lot of the big bands that are doing some big business are American bands and Aerosmith does a good job. But I don't think they do that great a job in 1973. Not quite yet. Not yet. Not yet. Anyway. 
All right, my final choice uh, might be the most heavy metal band, certainly on my list here. Uh, and to many people, they are considered, or this is considered the first official U.S. heavy metal album. And that is the self-titled debut from Montrose. Yeah. Right. And this is very much patterned after what the Brits were doing in that you've got a spectacular front man with a killer voice. You've got a guitar hero and a thunderous rhythm section. And, you know, again, many of these songs here are based on uh, blues patterns and things like that. But there is a distinct difference in the production. Of course, Ted Templeman worked on this album. Uh, you hear you've got the big distorted riffs. Uh, compact yet fiery guitar solos. You've got, like I said, that big bold front man out front. You've got amazing anthems on here, you know, Rock the Nation, Bad Motor Scooter, Space Station Number Five, Rock Candy, Make It Last, blah, blah, blah. Every song on here is an absolute classic. Um, but yet this album doesn't sound like any of the British bands, right? Even though the formula and, and what they're doing is probably patterned after, you know, specifically like Zeppelin and, uh, you yeah, know, mostly them. It doesn't sound like Zeppelin at all. It sounds really U.S. based and it's definitely metallic, right? There is there is a, you know, we were using the term heavy metal, even though at the time there really was no heavy metal. But this sounds like a heavy metal album. And, you know, you had so many bands that came out after this album, you know, like Boston and Van Halen and Moxie, right, who were doing, who took this and said, we can do that, too, or we want to do that, Right. But what the interesting thing is here, and again, we've kind of seen these patterns all over the place. They released this great, big, heavy debut album. And then by the second album, it, it's like Ronnie Montrose decided, yeah, I kind of want to go in a different direction. You know, it could have been the biggest band on the planet, right? But instead you got yeah. a, a follow-up album where he's basically saying goodbye to the singer already. And maybe only three or four tracks are really heavy. And the rest is kind of like, all right, that's a little different. And they would never really come back to this sort of thing again. But uh, one of the most important albums, I think, from a U.S. band uh, from this time period. And uh, definitely one that, you know, you can still go back and listen to it today. And it's like, yeah, that's that's pretty heavy and pretty kick-ass start to finish uh, for all the good reasons. Yeah. And, and I agree with what you said there. I, I, I think that's the first American heavy metal album, right? Ooh, Look at that front yeah. cover, eh? I, I think every Eagles album cover looks heavier than that, uh, that album cover, right? <laughs> that's, that's a really light looking album cover. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. And, and, you know, specifically, you know, rock, rock the nation for sure. But the one that really stands out is space station number five. That's, that's the one that sounds like a deep purple song, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so that, that sounds, uh, you know, as good as uh, your, your best foot forward from all the British bands. So yeah, that, that's where it all starts. And like you say, uh, you know, but, but even, uh, you know, they uh, j just, j just to prove almost more this point of, of the Americans not wanting to get it or not getting it or whatever is, is how Ronnie leaves it. Right. Although yeah. you know, they come, Warner brothers presents is a, is a pretty, pretty heavy record. And yeah, that's got its moments. It's got its yeah, I almost patriarch and all that. Right. I've always said, you know, because the first Montrose album is so short, I mean, it's barely over a half hour long mm -hmm. uh, for my money didn't plan that i almost it's almost like they, they should have taken like the best couple of songs from paper money threw it on the end of because uh, could you imagine like i got the fire yeah. on the first montrose album yeah yeah it belongs on that album it's like yeah, it's almost wow. like you know that that was like a leftover that ronnie's like all right we'll save that for the second album uh because you know there's parts of the second album that are just not very good at all it's almost like take those maybe two maybe three tracks tops that are amazing from the second album throw them on the first and that's that's the only album from that from that lineup right yeah. and it, that that makes it even more legendary i think but not to be and i got the fire it, you know had it been on that first album it would have been easily the second best song on it oh you know, yeah for sure and, and you know yeah. you'd, you'd even there'd even be a gap all the way back to even rock the nation but you know you'd got space station i got the fire almost close yeah and and then and, and then you know you step down to these other ones but uh but yeah because that was a good technical interesting song with the different speeds in it and all that stuff yeah right? yeah yeah, yeah it was, it's, a, it's a cool track. one of my favorite songs from that band i mean it's just yeah. ter absolutely terrific yeah. so so i mean you know we we've we've covered all the bases here i mean we've we've taken four full years 
and and we found one heavy metal album of out of all America. And, and you know, to remind people, America's bigger than Britain, right? You know, it's like there's a lot more music coming out of America, and and to and to you know to 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 survey the whole thing and find like one heavy metal album in all of those four years is is bizarre. Um, just I guess I guess you know that that blues tradition I guess stuck so much and and not having the classical tradition whatever and then seeing the success of Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Uri Heep even at that time with all those gold records and stuff you would have thought you know the light bulb would have gone off with somebody and it's like let's let's really participate in that and nobody did. Yeah, and it wasn't until like you know the middle of the decade that it really started and you know you could arguably say it wasn't until kind of Van Halen debuted that everything really got knocked on its ass right but that's a i guess a story for another day so yeah, yeah. so yeah so again in summary uh some great bands here that we love a lot but again i think our point today was that uh the attempt was being made by these american bands to kind of duplicate the success of what some of the british bands were doing especially specifically the big four and you know, not quite coming up to those levels, although great albums we showed and talked about today, lots of great songs. But in terms of uh, their importance in the history and annals of heavy metal, arguable for some of them. Right. Yeah. One other quick point. I mean, if if you want to, uh, you know, include Canada in this, um, there's there's a significant amount of heaviness from both Bachman Turner Overdrive and uh, and April Wine. Yes, for sure. Um, but the, you know, both of those are even still kind of starting out at this point. And then and then I'm not talking about Rush, or we're not talking about Rush because that's '74, right? So. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think the one uh, kind of the one band that got a little shortchanged in both of these discussions that we've had on these two episodes is Budgie from Wales. Uh, they kind of didn't really fit into any narrative, right? But uh, but arguably, they could, <clears throat> again, they probably sit right outside those first four, the original four that we talked about. They're probably, you know, a little more on the obscure side, but uh, Budgie, no less a heavy band from that early, early time period, uh, you yeah. know, 1970, 71. But uh, yeah, the, the thing, I, I, I usually leave them out because the first album is 71, but they, they were going, I think, 68, 69, and they yeah. were well known around. So I've met a lot of bands were influenced by Budgie that became heavy. That's a pretty neat story that probably needs to be told. But the first album, quite heavy for 1971. Yeah. The second album, you know, As we're in the 72 and they're getting even a little lighter. So it's it's still heavy for 72. 73 has got Bread Fan on it. You, you know, you've got In for the Kills, got kill. some pretty heavy stuff. Yeah. Bandolier by 75. So you've got you've got a good track record of some good heavy songs. Yeah, I mean, a band like Budgie and and, and comes to mind because we just lost Dan the other day. Uh, Nazareth is another band that kind of fits in this narrative as well. Sure, yeah. yeah. You know, any any uh, thoughts on the passing of Dan McCaffrey? Yeah, well, just just briefly before we get there. So so Naz Nazareth 71's got some heavy stuff on it. Exercises, no, but 73, they put out two albums. They put out Razmanaz and uh, Loud and Proud, and both of them have a lot of good, heavy stuff on them. Yeah. So they were a really heavy band. But yeah, um, you know, definitely, you know, met him a few times, a couple times, I think, um, but a lot of phone interviews with them. Uh, did a Nazareth coffee table book yeah. uh, recently. Um, and, you know, you know, well acquainted with Pete. Um, and just all over on Goldmine, we did a top 20 of the, um, you know, a tribute, the top 20 howling Dan McCafferty uh, performances. But he was always a sweetheart, super nice guy, very down to earth. You know, he'd meet anybody, he'd talk to anybody, have a beer with anybody. Um, and uh, and yeah, really good in, in interviews and stuff. Just good, modest guy. Legendary, legendary voice. But, you know, I always I always do this thing where it's like, um, you know, having a voice is one thing, but that's nothing to give anybody credit for. It's what you do with that voice. He was an amazing singer as well. So he had a great voice and he knew what to do with it. So, yeah, just a, a legendary guy and just a just a good salt of the earth, you know, Scottish uh, Scottish lad. And uh, he'd, he'd been not well for since about. 2013 2014 yeah. copd and um you know his strength his lung capacity was really bad it was even hard for him to walk a block or two kind of thing but you know he managed to get out a solo album in 2019 last testament which is i really like it it's really emotional and uh and you know really cuts to the bone and it's got a lot of mortality to it 
Um, but yeah, really cool album. Uh, people should check that out. And then, and then I always say that that last run of four, four Nazareth albums with him, um, you know, really reversed that reputation they had of all those albums where they were kind of all over the place through the eighties and nineties. So those last four are great. They're really, you know, I love rock and roll telephone. Blue, yeah. You know, yeah. Blues. Or, I mean, the news, big dogs, rock and roll telephone and boogaloo. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they're all really, they're really strong. And uh, I, I kind of touched on that as well when I did my tribute the other day. And such a unique voice who could really do it all. I mean, he had that gravelly roar. He could do the softer stuff really, really nice. And uh, just a real unique, unique character. And uh, it's just, just a shame we lost both him and Mandy just so close to each other. I mean, yeah, crazy is that, right? I saw your picture of the, 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 the uh, the album cover with all the other three taken off and just Pete left sitting at the table. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I suggested that to Marco from contrarians from our YouTube show. I say, and say, Hey, how easy is this to do or whatever? Cause he's done a few things like that. And, and he, he did it pretty quickly. He said, ah, it only took me five minutes. It would have been twice as good if I spent 10 minutes on it. But I said, man, you should do this because it's, it's cause I, I was, I was very struck by when that was done for motorhead ACE of spades, right. Where they're all three of them are missing off the big sand dune. Right and so so i thought of that and i think it looks great because pete's just looking at the camera he's looking right at you off of that poker table right yeah. i think that all all happened in vancouver that whole thing right that was all filmed there when they were because they were big that's the other thing with nazareth they were a massive massive band in canada um as i said in my tribute thing in the goldmine thing they had i think it was 10 um 10 albums in canada that that went either gold or platinum you know, in, which is amazing because in the States, they only had the one, the one album, I think it's platinum it. right here, the dog. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it's like 10 in Canada, but, uh, but yeah, I think that poker game, uh, I believe on the cover of playing the game was actually taking place in Vancouver. And Snaz was recorded in Vancouver as well, right? I can't quite remember or that. It might've it. been a little all over the place sort of thing. And yeah, they might have that been song it. Vancouver Shakedown and they, you know, there's all, they just have so many ties with Canada. They were always, and we always used to laugh because they were also one of these bands that would play every small town and go all over <laughs> Northern, Western Canada, all over the place. It's like they were real troopers for, for this territory. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm not sure if the whole live album is recorded there. I just know on the one song, Dan comes up to the microphone. He's like, Hey, Vancouver. Okay. Now I know what it feels like to play here. You guys are all right. Yeah. It's like, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and famously they took uh, rush on their first uh, cross Canada tour. So they, they, they took rush. I think it was 74, 75. And then the rush guys fondly remember, um, you know, renting a fishing boat in Vancouver and going out and fishing and, uh, there's, there's a little dispute of whether they caught a shark or a big fish or whatever. No one's, no one's got the story quite straight, but, uh, but yeah, so, so Nazareth or, or Rush always remembers that fondly as, as like, this is the first big band we ever went out with kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever heard any band who had anything bad to say about the guys in Nazareth. Yeah, true. It yeah. Seemed to be among their peers. They were very, yeah. very well respected. No, notoriously, they like to jar, right? They're big drinkers, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah, and, and you know, smokers too, unfortunately. But uh, yeah. yeah, they were, they were definitely known for their uh, alcohol consumption. Yeah. I, I was, uh, I was lucky. To, I only got to see uh, them with, you know, Dan once. And that was the last tour. Uh, and it was in New York City. And I remember like halfway through the show, he just walked off stage right in the middle of the show. And he had to go backstage and, and go on the oxygen machine for a little while. He barely was able to finish the show. And I don't know how many more. I don't think they did many more shows after that. And he he, he stepped away from the band. So I caught yeah. one of the last shows he did. You know, yeah. I was lucky to see yeah. that. He was, you know, he was struggling. Yeah. One, one last thing. I mean, sentimentally, he, he was, uh, you know, I lost my brother at 49 years old, right? He's a couple, couple years younger than me. And it, it, Nazareth was his favorite band. And even my dad and my brother saw them in a small bar in Nelson, BC. Like they would, they would come through. They played this tiny bar. We were talking about it yesterday, actually. Um, you know, reminding dad, that, Hey, you've seen this guy before. Right. So, so dad took Brad um, and they, and they went and saw Nazareth and Nelson. And I think I saw them at some small place there too, but I saw them a small bar in, in Toronto as well. Um, yeah. They, they, they loved Canada. And that was that other thing, right? I mean, everybody, you know, people talk about 
A&M Canada did a really good job for people, right? So, so for some reason, so that's one reason Nazareth did great here, but sticks, sticks always did great here. And, and even status quo for any of this, the sort of success they had, you know, all of that stuff on A&M Canada was distributed. Well, I mean, can, Canadians could buy status quo albums, no problem. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Not, not as much here, I guess. Yeah. Oh, well. All right, Martin, let's uh, give us some updates on your end, uh, contrarians, podcasts, books, all that sort of thing. Actually, there is a big update. Uh, three days ago, two days ago, I received copies of Killing the Dragon, Dio in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, and they did a beautiful job printing. It's my usual kind of, you know, chapter by whatever, but it's got two tipped in color sections. It's the follow up to Dream Evil, Dio in the 80s. And so I've, and it's been selling well. I've been, I've been uh, shipping a lot of those out. Got a, got another big batch to go, but yeah, that's not big handy one. to show up, show everybody. What's that? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Uh, there's both of them together. Cool. Great covers on those. Wow. So yeah. yeah, big, thick books, you know, there's uh, I think this is 284 pages, the second one. So uh, there's your two covers. So that's the entire Dio story. Finally. <laughs> updated from the old metal metal blade one and uh yeah lots going on contrarians and uh you know we've got a uh, I, uh this weekend i think i'm going to do another new wave of british heavy metal based uh, history and five songs podcast episode i i took a list uh, a look this would be but like my 10th on the new wave of british heavy metal so yeah <laughs> can never have enough martin <laughs> yeah can never have enough Cool. Well, that's a wrap for today, everybody. Uh, let's see, what do we got coming up here on the channel? We've got uh, tomorrow, we've got the UK connection. So tune in, uh, Simon, Stephen, and I will be ranking the songs on a classic album. That classic album is Magnum's On a Storyteller's Night, their classic album from the mid 80s. So uh, that's coming up on Saturday, tomorrow. And then Sunday, uh, Ben Duda is coming back on the channel. He and I are going to rank the catalog of German progressive technical death metal titans Obscura. So that's coming up on Sunday. And then, of course, we uh, kickstart the work week off with the Hudson Valley Squares on Monday. So uh, till then, have a good weekend, everybody. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Click on that notification bell and uh, visit us on the web at www.seaoftranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. All together, all the damn time. For Martin Popoff, I am Pete Paro. Have a good weekend, everybody. We'll see you next Friday here at the Fun House. Take care.